So I think uh, we can start with the uh, IQ deep illumination. I have uh, several questions I had in mind, a couple of more during my presentation. Um, before we go to the technical details, I, I'd like to uh, ask you uh, about a few general things. As I mentioned in my uh, summary at the introduction, there are many things to study about miniaturizing fuels. So I accept the fact that we are in men's group, so our job is to miniaturize things. I'm not questioning miniaturizing things. But when you miniaturize a fuel cell, there are many, many things you can do. You decided to work on um, channel fabrication and nanograms. So what was the, your motivation behind? Instead of doing other things, I'm not saying it's wrong, it actually is good, but I'd like to see, maybe if you go back a few years before, when, before you started, what was the motivation to choose the, pro the actual project for the project? Okay, so, uh, well, uh, uh, when, I, when I approached uh, Professor San Francisco, <coughs> he proposed, I think, two different uh, projects. And then one of them was uh, later on kind of taken by another student. And I was, uh, if I remember the facts correctly, I was late with the multiple cells which was actually a good fit for me because I have a master's in electrical engineering. So that was a good thing. And um, <clears throat> I did not have any idea what a microfuel cell is at that point. I just knew that it, uh, it's, uh, it produces electricity, but nothing else. And then um, I had uh, some already experience with the silicon microfabrication. And uh, some of my colleagues were working with this black silicon, mm -hmm. and they were using it for experiments with wetting and uh, also for some uh, gas chromatographic research. So let's say that I was somewhat familiar with black silicon, and uh, I was, uh, if I may say so, a little bit lazy in the sense that I was always thinking about the simplest way of fabricating something. If it works I, and, and it's simple, then I like it. So to me, it seemed very simple to make the mic, uh, this uh, gas diffusion layer in just one step by etching the silicon surface with the uh, different chemistry. So basically this etching step is integrated in the uh, silicon microfabrication, in such a way that you etch the, uh, the channels. And the next thing you do, well, depending of course how you put the steps exactly, but uh, you can do it that way, that you etch those channels and then you make the uh, black silicon by just changing the chemistry in the same reactor. You don't even have to take the wafer out of the reactor. So um, I saw here that I can save several fabrication steps, and also the device is very uh, integrated. I don't have to add anything. I just subtract to create the gas diffusion layer. So that sounded to me like a good idea and a good way to both miniaturize efficiently and uh, decrease costs by decreasing microfabrication steps. Mm -hmm. So your interest was, uh, electron I look like a change little bit at the beginning, you wanted to make a, a more efficient um, analytic effect? Is it, uh, in my well, no, not really, no. Uh, so um, I didn't want to, of course, interrupt you. <laughs> but uh, what I did is I noticed that, of course, I have this silicon nanograss, mm -hmm. or glass silicon, mm -hmm. which are very narrow pillars, but they have to be uh, electrically conducted mm -hmm. in order for this kind of microfuel cell to work. Because in this kind of microfuel cell, we don't have a separate current collector. The chip itself is the current collector, which is another thing that I thought will decrease the cost and the fabrication steps. So all I did was choose a highly doped silicon wafer uh, to work as a, the current collector. And then, of course, I noticed, yes, but then this silicon nanograss has to be conductive. Of course it is, because it's made of highly conductive silicon, but um, it can oxidize during the work of the fuel cell. And uh, uh, this native oxide, if it becomes too thick, it might uh, decrease the performance of the fuel cell. So for that reason, I decided to cover 
these uh, silicon nanograms with a metal that were conducted, which will not uh, <coughs> oxidize. And the options there are not many. And most authors use uh, gold for something like this, or platinum. Right? I didn't have access to, plat uh, to gold, so that's why I tried platinum first. So I would uh, sputter about 10 nanometers of chromium as an adhesion, uh, adhesion layer, and then about 40 nanometers of uh, platinum just uh, to protect the silicon nanograms from oxidation. Okay, so now I understand. So you made the nanograms to make electric con electrical uh, connection better with your fuel? No, it's just a gas diffusion layer. It's a very simple gas diffusion layer. It's only two microns thick. So um, uh, commercial gas diffusion layers are about 100 microns thick. It's only two microns, but still it works. I mean, some, some microfuel cell authors uh, have gas diffusion layers that only a few uh, tens of nanometers. So this is still better than that. How would you deposit metal in high spec ratio nanograms? I was uh, sputtered. So I was, I was counting on, on relatively conformal deposition. But uh, if I just may add something to this uh, discussion. Um, and this is, I think, an important contribution of my, of my first article, article. And that is that uh, in addition to this platinum, later on I just tried to use chromium, just thicker layer of chromium. And that worked just fine, as you can see from my, my first article. It, it had no drawbacks, basically. And it's much cheaper than platinum. And from that day on, uh, uh, when we characterized the, the fuel cells with the chromium, I was always wondering why authors use thick layers of gold or even thin layers of gold when chromium works just fine for this application. Uh, the fact that the platinum is the uh, most common uh, deposition on your grass, other people too, does, does it mean it's a uh, catalytic surface? Uh, well, I don't use the catalyst on the silicon nanograms. I use the catalyst. So we did try this. We did try to have a, a natrium membrane without catalyst, mm -hmm. directly contacting the silicon nanograms with the platinum. And that uh, gave very poor performance. So then we decided. Do you use a natrium, uh, natrium and your nanograms directly? On I, we tried that, yes. We tried that. So that means there is no other uh, catalyst? There was only the catalyst on the nanograms in that yeah. first experiment, which is not published because uh, and uh, the performance good. was poor. Maybe I should have published as a negative result. Like, you don't do this, it's no point. But uh, unfortunately, scientists nowadays don't publish negative results very much. Anyhow, so what we did is then we replaced this uh, um, nation with an NEA. Mm -hmm. So it already had the catalyst on the surface. Okay. Um, uh, I was very interested in your aluminum uh, uh, fabrication. Um, so aluminum, the patterning, chemical patterning of aluminum has been around for nine minutes for you know, like large aeroplane, airplane wings and they want, after they make the airplane wing, if you want to reduce the surface thickness because to, to reduce the weight, they can do it, uh, what is called chemical blanking. Uh, chemical blanking is actually make it heavy, but you know, make it. And so they are available, but never, I don't think it was done in your way in, in MEMS. So that I appreciate that your last paper, number five, right? Um, and there was an interesting comment you had, which you also mentioned uh, in the presentation was, it's not pure uh, aluminum, so there are silicon there which doesn't get etched. Uh, so you leave uh, some junk behind, so you have to wash them out to continue. Yes. Um, but for your case, why did you decide to use alloy instead of pure aluminum? Uh, for the simple reason that uh, to get, uh, well, like first of all, uh, I was looking for pure aluminum wafers, but couldn't find any. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to work with wafers, that is uh, four inch uh, circles, then there was only one provider, and they had 6061 aluminum. And so I, I said, 
let's try, let's see what happens. And then I saw what happens, and uh, I have analyzed it actually in quite a detail in, in that article. Mm -hmm. So that was really an important part of the article to analyzing, uh, to analyze the roughness of the surface, how it increases, uh, what's the um, relationship between the roughness and the edge rate. And you can see that the edge rate decreases with the edge time, and the roughness also increases with the edge time. I think I analyzed that actually thoroughly. And um, also, I mentioned the fact that there is a patina that is formed, which one should uh, wash away with a jet of water. So um, I'm actually happy that I, uh, that I used the uh, aluminum alloy because I, I uh, obtained a rough surface, which uh, proved to be useful for two reasons. One reason which I mentioned during the lecture, which is, or maybe I didn't mention, sorry, during the lecture, but I do believe that this roughness increases uh, the conductivity between the gas diffusion layer and the substrate. That's one. And the other one is that uh, it uh, helps with the adhesion of the photoresist during the second uh, lithography step. So in the second lithography step, uh, we have uh, the photoresist is spinned on the edge to basins before we prepare the, uh, the flow field. Mm -hmm. So we have the basin, which has been etched, and it's very rough. But we spin the resist, and I noticed uh, that it helps with the adhesion of the resist. So then, if I may just draw a picture. Uh, you had in your presentation one picture where you can see uh, these kind of channels. In aluminum, okay. and the uh, photoresist was somewhere here. So we had delamination, partial delamination of the photoresist. These channels uh, were obtained by spinning the resist on a polished wafer surface. Did you polish or is it polished? No, they, they, you can you can buy them polished. Too. That's so that was that was really a good thing. But uh, when you spin the resist on the rough surface. I will draw the rough surface like this. And then you have, let's say, a resist here. When you etch, in this case, you will not have this partial delamination. Actually, very interestingly, you can see on the, on the SDM picture, the, uh, the profile is more or less like this. So, Instead of, oh, sorry for the, the bad quality of my drawing, but you don't have this, which is really good because this way I increased the, uh, or better say, I better control the surface that is in contact with the gas diffusion layer. It's not random, it's better defined. Okay, so I agree with uh, your application uh, that roughness doesn't matter, roughness is even better. So when I see um, aluminum as a new material for men's, uh, with general contribution for men's community, um, that is different. So they want to, a lot of times they want to have smooth sidewalls and things like that. So, um, so naturally, I was thinking, so why, why didn't you use pure aluminum? Your answer is yes, the wafer was not available. Oh, yeah, I didn't finish answering the oh, question, sorry. sorry. Later on, I did try to source pure aluminum. But you would be surprised how extremely expensive pure aluminum is. Silicon wafers are actually cheap, which are which have I don't know how many nines of purity. They are electronically pure, and yet they are uh, orders of magnitude. I would say one order of magnitude cheaper than pure aluminum mm -hmm. plates. Mm -hmm. So they would not be even wafer; they would be plates, and then we would have to cut them. So they were um, hundreds of dollars per single way. So I, I under, can understand the uh, pure aluminum is much mechanically much weaker than the alloy, so it's, there's not much uh, commercial uh, demand. Uh, yes, yes, that, that is the problem. That is the problem. And of course, also, I think it's a, a metallurgical problem. When they prepare the aluminum, it's not pure to begin with. So um, it already contains some uh, magnesium, some iron, and some uh, silicon. So then these alloys are just, you know, they just look let's add more silicon then and see what happens. And what happens is that uh, the alloy has higher hardness. Yeah. So 66 to 1, for instance, is, uh, um, well, 
it's much harder than pure aluminum. So you got your hands on uh, pure aluminum and did you do the aluminum? No, 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 I didn't get my hands on pure aluminum. I hope that uh, we can uh, purchase uh, So the, the, actually the cheapest way to get pure aluminum is to buy uh, aluminum target, sputtering target from eBay. Believe it or not, that is the cheapest version. And it's, that one is really pure. But even the, the aluminum uh, in the deposit and electric, electro, electric layers for semiconductor is not, they don't really apply to deposit pure aluminum. They actually put some silicon. Copper. Uh, oh. Copper and sometimes silicon yeah. too. So yeah, this is because of the electromigration. Right. I actually wrote a, a, work, a work about that. And, uh, and it, okay, just uh, very quickly, I will tell you that they found out by mistake that adding 1% of copper will decrease the electromigration a lot. It happened in IBM. There was this engineer who noticed that there was one evaporator that was producing exceptionally good integrated circuits. But it contaminated. Yeah, it was because the electron uh, EV was hitting the crucible, so it was adding a bit of copper. Okay, good. Uh, so when I finished your uh, number five, uh, I think naturally the question I had was, okay, you will, so it was unusual for men's people trying to machine silicon with the laser. So when we uh, laser ablation, you were, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you went to a, a, a aluminum, which is unusual material, you were using solar. You yeah. probably thought about using laser ablation for aluminum. Oh yes, absolutely. Yes. And I contacted these people in Germany, but uh -huh. never got any answer. Oh, so there was yeah, no absolutely. I, I had yeah, yeah. This is one of my ideas. Was and in theory still is. If I had the laser ablation system, I would totally do that. So it's not a, there's no technical reason not to do it, just uh, no, no, no. logistics. It would, it would totally work, it would be a very interesting uh, uh, project, and if you have access to a laser ablation station, I would be happy to, uh, you know, participate in no, that. No. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Uh, however, if I may add, <coughs> a laser ablation station is very expensive. And I thought, if I'm going to use aluminum, even aluminum alloy, which is low-tech material compared to pure silicon, um, and I'm going to use such a low-tech equipment for etching, you know, uh, that is much cheaper than a laser ablation station. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if you want to uh, develop a, a microfluidic process for Africa, uh, then this, uh, this is better. Because you can, in theory, do um, lithography without uh, alignment. If you are satisfied with one uh, alignment, no, no alignment basically, just a single mask, mm -hmm. then you can just apply the mask and use a UV lamp. Mm -hmm. And then you thought about other methods like uh, just molding, very traditional manufacturing. Uh, oh yeah, but that, but that would require, I think, a pure aluminum because it would require it to be uh, soft. Okay, I think it's correct. So you need a very high strength mold, soft aluminum. Um, it was interesting that you actually uh, said uh, um, when you had a, a silicon containing aluminum, when you did the uh, etching, you had this junk that you had to pour hot water. Oh, sure. um, just water. Yeah, so that was interesting because, as you may know, uh, the nanograss black silicon was originally considered bad. Yeah, right. So I even had my own, own experience when I was working in the lab that when I was making deep etching into polymer, which is just oxygen RIE, I had the nanograss. I see, yeah. Uh, that was well before black silicon was found useful. Um, but I did exactly what you did. I poured hot water <laughs> to continue and go deeper. Oh, I see. So when I read the, your hot water throwing technique, I, I actually shared those with you. Yeah, that's good. Um, Okay, so after you made your um, uh, structures and, and nanograss, all these things, you did go through uh, characterization of your fuel cell. Yes, sir. Um, so when you do all this testing, you actually have to provide your fuel. Right? So how did you provide the fuel? Did you have a pump or? Oh, yeah, well, uh, so the characterization was done in the chemical, uh, mm. physical chemistry lab. Mm -hmm with uh, my co-author, Petri Kandinen, and they have their post-potential stats and the uh, uh, gas flow controllers. 
of mass flow controllers, sorry. And of course, they have their bottles of hydrogen and oxygen, and uh, also, of course, methanol that is not available there. So for methanol, of course, I would uh, use this uh, peristatic pump, mm -hmm. but mostly we were using the hydrogen as a fuel, and that was there uh, available. Uh, hydrogen. My impression of reading your thesis was at the beginning you were using hydrogen. Yes, Later yes. on, you used the uh, switch to methanol. Um, in some in some articles, I may also try methanol, uh, but uh, mostly it's hydrogen. Mostly hydrogen. Or yes, 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 yes. How about oxygen? Did you provide oxygen? Yeah, yeah, to yeah. Also oxygen. Pump? And again, in in some of the experiments, we're done in air, but uh, and that was also interesting. We did not have actual uh, artificial air, so we just used the air from uh, the compressed air of, of the building, I think, and. Uh, which was unfiltered and uh, mm. tried that. The, the uh, humidity and the temperature was uh, not controlled, so we, we tried that. And but doesn't your, your electrical, electrochemic, electrochemical calculation, like uh, the curve, the curve, performance curves, um, and they not only function of your structure, but also the, the, the weight of your fuel? Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. I, I completely agree with that, yes, yes. Um, Probably, it's probably being mentioned about the flow rate of the fuel. Yes, yes, the it's yes because yes. It, because there's a, no, not did not emphasize because it's a usual rate. So it's not. Yeah, yeah. So I we always use the same uh, the same flow rate for both the hydrogen and oxygen, um, except for a set of experiments that have not been published yet. Mm -hmm. Where I think we change into the the flow rate and trade it trade with that. So the oxygen side, cathode side, when you provide normal air, room air. How, how did you handle the water? Uh, there, the water forms at the cathode side. Uh, yes. So, but basically, we had more problems with water when we when we used oxygen than we did when we used it, air. It did more activity. It's more. Uh, yeah, it was more active and it was uh, uh, humidified. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, when we used the uh, air, it was not humidified, so it was probably at the standard finish forty percent uh, relative humidity. So that means uh, the. Water you generate from cathode side evaporates fast enough. So yes, yes, we, we didn't actually have much problems with water. Uh, generally speaking, well, there were some issues with the <coughs> with this um, uh, the second article, which was the uh, using black silicon as a bell crop. Mm -hmm. There, uh, there we did also a um, cyclic voltammetry. Which showed us that there is quite a lot of, of water condensate, um, but it didn't completely kill the performance, <laughs> so to say. So we did manage to uh, to do our from our, uh, my, at least the uh, uh, polarization curves were were done. The, the cathode side, when you provide the air, was it through what was the uh, pumping mechanism? Was it yeah, we, we have, so the, the, there is a compressed uh, oxygen, uh -huh. and then there is the uh, mass flow controller. So, so the mass flow controller keeps this, uh, the rate. So it was from the pressurized gas? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Pressurized gas was the air, yeah. and fuel was from prosthetic pump. Uh, it, it, when it was liquid fuel, yes. But when it was hydrogen, then it was the same thing. So we also yeah. used the compressed hydrogen and, uh, and the mass flow controller. And the pressure of those, you know, especially when it was uh, hydrogen methanol, also the pressure to flow them was regulated so that there is not much uh, crossover, fuel crossover. Uh, so I, I did not pay attention. Was already done. No, I we didn't actually pay attention to, to fuel crossover, mm -hmm. but um, okay, we did again as another set of experiments, uh, which is unpublished and probably never will be published. When we tried to measure uh, the, um, for uh, guess the amount of uh, methanol that crosses over, and uh, found out that uh, at least with the uh, with the flow rates that we used, which were from a few tens of microliters per minute to maybe a few hundred microliters per minute, I don't remember what was the maximum, but at those flow rates it was negligible. It was not important. OK, 
Okay, so you did the characterization that showed uh, uh, your way of making the, the structures and architecture of your fuel cell was getting better and better. Um, the gas diffusion layer uh, you used, uh, that's co commercial gas diffusion layer? Yes, uh, later on for, for, the, for the fuel cells um, with the uh, black silicon as a velcro mm -hmm. and with the aluminum uh, fuel cells there I used the commercial. Whereas the first article and the later updated ones, they did not. They did not use the commercial gas diffusion layer. So what is the commercial diffusion layer made of? What is it? Oh, so it's uh, there are two variants. There is a so-called uh, carbon cloth and carbon felt. So one is uh, uh, before it was uh, pyrolyzed, one was a cloth, the other was one was a felt, and then they pyrolyzed them. So then you just have this. Uh, so, so the felt is denser than the cloth. Um, no, I think the cloth is more dense. Yeah, yeah. It's a woven. So the cloth is woven. Mm -hmm. The felt is not woven. It's mm -hmm. just uh, fibers going into the air. But then what they do is after they uh, pyrolyze them and obtain this uh, uh, carbon uh, fiber kind of uh, material, then uh, they add carbon black. Mm -hmm. They do it uh, kind of a screen printing thing or with a squeegee. Mm -hmm. So they add it to one side. Mm -hmm. So one side is that microporous side, which has the carbon black. The other one is macroporous. And there you can just see directly the, um, the structure of the carbon belt. Uh, you can see this in the uh, second uh, or third, the third publication there, the one with the, which uses the black silicon as a for contact with it. So where do they, um, so the carbon diffusion layer is commercially available for fuel cell? Yes, 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 for, for microfuel. For yeah. large scale. Yes. Okay, so you now developed and you characterized uh, electrochemically uh, to verify your uh, what is the uh, good way to do it. Um, and then, during that time, you had this uh, aluminum block squeezing your fuel cell, your fuel cell, to get uh, the testing done. Yeah, that's right. I uh, had an aluminum chip. Well, leakage was not a problem. Does the leakage oh, yeah, affect your performance? <laughs> in, in there was a problem, but uh, we had to deal with it. So it was not a huge problem. Even though one time uh, we had the hydrogen crossing over the membrane, getting in touch with the oxygen, and of course there is catalyst there. So we had uh, we had uh, actually a flame, I think. But it did not blow up with the lab. <laughs> But it was a it happened once. But generally, we um, we always check that we have true flow of the gas. So before we start characterizing, we check the uh, let's say output of the uh, both the anode and the cathode side to see whether we have gases flowing through. Okay. So now that you you said that at the beginning you didn't know anything about fuel cell, now you have a PhD. Yeah. Um, I'm not his doctoral degree here, thank you. Um, on fuel cell, micro fuel cell. So now you probably have a much more knowledge, but also perspective. So if one wants, to, if you want to uh, use your knowledge and your technology to make a commercial micro scale or mini miniature uh, fuel cell, what is your thought? What do you, what do you think should be a micro fuel cell? What does micro fuel cell should look like? Okay, all right, so... You can uh, dream. Yes, yes. Well, when I was in uh, Amsterdam, I, I, I uh, presented, uh, presented some unpublished uh, results. There, there was this fuel cell 2014. And I talked with some colleagues, and of course listened to many presentations, and I came uh, to the conclusion that uh, actually hydrogen is a very good candidate as a fuel, even though everybody complains about the fact, oh yes, but how are we going to compress it? But I think the problems of compressing hydrogen are much fewer than those that are presented by using uh, an alcohol as a fuel. Because you have to add water to this alcohol and you drastically decrease uh, 
energy density that way. So somehow then what you would like to do is to have pure alcohol and then uh, water which then you recycle. And that uh, complicates matters quite a lot. So in my view, uh, um, the first commercial microfuel cells that would really work would probably have a small compressed reservoir of hydrogen because then we, uh, we don't have uh, many of the problems with the uh, with recycling of water. We don't have we don't have to pump the fuel also. Whereas uh, <clears throat> whereas with liquid fuels we might have to. Not necessarily, of course, with microfuel cells we can use uh, capillary effects to our advantage. But uh, it's a question how it will work if you want to recycle the the, the water. We have a uh, compressed hydrogen as a source, so your fuel cell will last until your compressed hydrogen yes. depletes. Yes, yes. So uh, nowadays, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, uh, these uh, hydrogen cars, uh, the ones that use uh, hydrogen fuel cells, they use uh, containers that are standardized either for 350 bars or 700 bars. Mm -hmm. And now the 700 bar standard is, is getting much more uh, popular, so to say, mm -hmm. and I can imagine that you could have a 700 bar container for microfuel cells. Then, if I may just present something very briefly, <clears throat> this is something I actually just looked up last night, but uh, it's interesting. So I, I looked up uh, the fact about uh, how thick should be the walls of a compressed container. Compressed, okay. Right, right. So now let's imagine here. We have, for simplicity's uh, case, I mean, uh, say, let's imagine a, circuit, uh, it's a spherical container. We have a certain volume of gas at a certain pressure. Now, if we have a smaller container, right? And with, of course, a smaller volume, so let's call this V2, this is V1, and V2 is much more than but at the same pressure, then we find out that actually the volume of the side wall of these walls is proportional to the volume of, of the gas. And of course, it's proportional to the pressure, blah, blah, blah. But if the pressure is the same, then that means that if you have, let's say, a certain amount of gas, then uh, that would be proportional to a certain amount of container material. And it will be the same. So whether you have a large amount or a small amount, the proportion, let's say, if you use uh, 10 moles of hydrogen, you will need 20 moles of steel. Okay, this steel, you would not uh, describe it. Is this a cylindrical or is it a steel? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it, it works out the same. It's only thing that I, I draw a circle because it's easy to draw. <laughs> but if you use a, uh, a cylinder, the same, same proportion applies. So if you have a container that will survive hydrogen at 700 bar, that container uh, contains one liter of hydrogen, and you need, uh, and that container has to be, uh, let's say, five kilograms heavy. Okay. Look, like, look like it is true only if it's a cylinder, if it's a spherical. It's, it's, it's true for, for any shape. And the only thing that changes is the proportion of uh, uh, how, what kind of pressure it will survive, whether it's a, a sphere or a cylinder with spherical ends. Yeah, but the volume is not linear. The volume doesn't proportional. No, 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 it's not proportional. I'm just saying that, that if the volume, so volume one divided by volume of the container, the complete volume of this metal here, mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So let's call it V, Steel, let's say Vs1, Vs1 is equals to V2 divided by Vs2. So we have no advantage or disadvantage by scaling down the container. There is no like, you know, in micro fabrication, something scales later, something scales. Here it's exactly the same. So you don't lose. You don't lose, you don't gain. 
-hmm. but you don't lose. And, and that's yeah. a good point. That is that is uh, the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So you could have tiny little containers at very high pressure, and but they will work. If it's too heavy, then you make smaller containers, which will contain less uh, overall space. How would you, uh, how do they, in the bigger scale, how do they uh, regulate the release? How do you have a bell? How oh, yeah, they, they have a bleed bulb. So how does it work? Does well, it uh, I believe they look have look like a hydrogen building. How is hydrogen is extremely difficult? Well, I don't know, but they probably use uh, um, a Teflon uh, because Teflon is a good material for, for this kind of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, no, the, the, the people said that they the hydrogen containers are simply made of steel. And then I was a bit surprised, oh, but you know, like the hydrogen is like, it goes to everything and it's not, but we use steel. So it is. So you need a belt to. Uh, yeah, and, and the bleed uh, valve, I don't know exactly, I'm not a, not a, a mechanical engineer in hydraulics, yeah. but uh, I imagine that they use some kind of, that would be the easiest to use a bleed valve. But if, if they are very sophisticated, they might use actually a mass flow controller. Because with a mass flow controller, they can control with much higher precision than with a big valve. Plus, they, they, can, uh, they, can, they can have a, a feedback loop, an electrical feedback loop from the engine saying, OK, uh, decrease the amount of uh, electrical energy, meaning decrease the amount of hydrogen. And so, yeah. I, so that's why I guess that. Uh, uh, mass flow controller would be better. So you have a uh, hydrogen source. That would, I totally agree. If that works, I still don't know how, how difficult it is to uh, control the release of the uh, hydrogen. But if that works, then yes, there is no circulation you need. You just, you just bleed out yeah. whatever you need. Um, the oxygen side, I'm not that sure. Yes, the oxygen side will have to be a uh, self breathing cell. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that you compress oxygen. Just like hydrogen. Uh, okay, that would be a, uh, that's that's a possibility if you want really good performance. But if you are fine with okay performance, mm -hmm. um, overall, I think you can you can achieve better um, miniaturization by just uh, focusing on self breathing. So environment air. Yes, yes, I, I do believe that that is. So th these are my predictions. If I <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if I'm a prophet, my prophecy is that the. Um, for uh, for these applications like mobile phones, mm -hmm. which are uh, like uh, should be relatively cheap, I think that we will not have a container for the oxygen, mm -hmm. but uh, we will have a container. What would be the drawback of not having? What would be the drawback of using environmental air? Okay, there are two that I can think of. One is that the performance is uh, lower. It could be up to one order of magnitude lower, depending on on uh, the regime in which the fuel cell works. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the other uh, drawback is that uh, uh, ambient air in some countries is, uh, is polluted. <laughs> and so your mobile phone will just stop working because you know, it gets too much pollution and uh, unless you filter it out. But then if you filter it, then again, you need somehow to actively, I guess, uh, pump the air and that is just uh, not very nice. But all in all, all in all, I think, uh, especially especially when we solve the problem of the catalyst, and we might solve it because now you have, for instance, this uh, alkaline membrane mm -hmm. fuel cells. Mm -hmm. uh, those alkaline membrane fuel cells they use uh, cobalt and nickel as catalyst, so which is much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we might solve the problem of the catalyst. So they need a higher temperature, don't they? Uh, no, they just have bad performance. <laughs> It's just not very good uh, at the moment, but uh, you know, it's a uh, progress is slow, right? So, um, so assuming that the fuel cell itself will be cheap because they will they will find my article and say, ah, let's make it from aluminum, hopefully. So cheap material, uh, then um, the uh, catalyst is cheap. So if the uh, fuel cell itself is cheap enough then the problem of pollution is not so severe because you can uh, you can afford to just uh, replace it. Then you just keep the reservoir, which never, uh, the hydrogen reservoir, and then just throw away the, uh, the fuel cell part of it after, I don't know, a certain so time. So I think you have enough idea of how overall it looks like, but physically, how would it look like? And if I 
go backwards. So this is your commercial product, just like one of the picture, the commercial yeah. product you have. A product. Yeah. If I ask you to draw what's inside, how would you draw your field sign? <laughs> <laughs> You uh, now have one, it, yeah, you have one, <laughs> one stack of fuel cell that yeah. you start, yeah, yeah. whether it's aluminum so, or not, right, one right. stack. Yeah, so, so if self breeding would, in, this, in the case of a self breeding cell, then the stack would have the cells one next to the other, mm -hmm. not really stacked. So I don't know if this can be called a stack, but you know what I mean. Just a series of cells in order to have a high enough voltage for the yeah. So where's the cathode surface? That, because you have to breathe there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the cathode is, is towards the wall, let's say. Uh -huh. right? um, and self breathing. So I would imagine I would imagine it would be um, some kind of grid. Right? Metallic grid. Alright, so, uh, so, so my concern is so look like your fuel cell is going to be very thin. Sure. That's a good thing, I, I would hope. Uh, do you have enough energy if it's only one? So you have only one layer. I, okay. So, so we have we have this grid, right? Yeah. There is this uh, mesh, metallic grid, metallic mesh. Um, that would be the cathode. So it's electrically conductive, mm -hmm. right? And because it's a grid, uh, the air can pass towards the uh, the cathode, mm -hmm. the cathode cathodes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's let's draw this uh, transversal. Here we have our our uh, membrane, and let's say that is this uh, alkaline membrane with cheap catalyst here. Nickel, for instance, uh, particles. Let's say that these are nickel nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. And then here we have the mesh on top. Uh, okay. So imagine that I draw this as here. <laughs> this is the mesh. These are the, 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 the wires of the mesh that go in, 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 in towards the, the wall. Okay, and then uh, the um, anode, of course, again, it will have this uh, nickel nano, mm -hmm. nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. And then here we will have actually uh, an actual flow field to distribute. Mm -hmm. To distribute the, the hydrogen right, from the tank. Okay. Yes, yes, that's right. Okay, so again, it's one layer, one layer of uh, fuel cell. Okay, so I didn't throw here the gas diffusion layer. Sorry. Yeah. I, that's no, 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 no. I'm not talking about inside. Yeah. So this is one. one. This is one. Yeah. So this is so one. So your fuel cell is not stacked. It's not stacked. It, it, as you see here, my idea would be to put several one next to the other. In side by side. Side by so side. You, yeah. So if you need a lot uh, enough energy, maybe you need a very large. Ah, okay. So, but uh, regarding the energy, uh, yes, uh, regarding the energy. So there are two questions here. One is the, the power that you want to obtain, and the other is the voltage. So we need to have minimum voltage because of DC DC conversion. So uh, for DC DC conversion, in order to step up the voltage to what is used in the mobile phones, which is around 3.3 volts, something like that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we have two options, of course. We might uh, have four, for instance, four or five cells. Four or five cells, that would, that would get us close to 3.3 volts, close enough under load, right? Um, but uh, I think that's not a very good idea because, because if you segment your surface too much, then you lose, then you lose surface. So in, in, in we have to find a balance. Not too many cells in order to utilize the surface that is available better, but not too few because uh, high performance DC DC converters don't work very well at low voltages. So if you feed a DC DC converter, even state of the art, if you feed it with only, let's say, one volt, it's hard to step up to, let's say, 3.3 volts without losing half of the, of the power. So that's, that's the problem. So uh, for that reason, I would say that we need a couple of volts at least to feed our DC-DC converter, which then would step up uh, to the voltage that we need for the mobile phone. My, my concern is less with uh, the voltage, because you only need maybe three uh, to get enough, maybe, yeah. maybe five. But I'm more concerned about the current 
for the power. Yes, yes. So that, that and that is the, the question of the power. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> in my view, again, uh, in order to maximize the power, we would need at least let's say two volts, and we need a large enough surface, as you were indicating. So uh, how we would do this? Okay, now this was just like. A, something I drew here, but we can imagine, for instance, that the back panel of the mobile phone would be actually covered the, in the inside with fuel cells. Mm -hmm. They can be made to be very thin, mm -hmm. so they don't represent a big issue in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, our uh, back panel would increase in thickness by maybe less than one millimeter. Your vision is to have a back area of cell phone yeah, uh, and a cathode as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, it will not uh, look bad because, of course, you can cover it with uh, with some nice looking mesh, with with a, a microphone, which at the same time will maybe work as a gas filter. If I put on the table, yeah, then that's a, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a, that's a, well, but uh, hopefully, if you put it on the table, then it's not going to use too much, uh, too much power. I was trying to see if I did, can do calculation, but I don't know how much uh, power or you need for cell phone. But my guess is to power this yeah. with the one layer of cell, uh, your fuel cell, you may need uh, the whole screen of area to power. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, really? Because because this the, this surface is let's say about uh, a little bit less than uh, one square decimeter, right? Uh, so let's say about eighty square centimeters, mm -hmm. yeah. or let's say 70 square centimeters. 70 square centimeters, if you think about the fact that I managed to get 1.1 amp, one, one amp, yeah. amp from one square centimeter, okay, that was the maximum current density uh, which was obta obtained with oxygen, and granted uh, that at the maximum current density the voltage is not sufficient, but Let's let's scale down everything there, and let's say in the worst case scenario that that we obtain hundred uh, milliamps mm -hmm. per square centimeter. Yeah. With with available, let's say seventy square centimeters, I think I think we're good. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. But you know, you it's not only to you. Question is not only to you, but also to me. I'm always curious whether one layer is important or not because. As you may know well, one layer and two layer makes a huge difference in right. terms of uh, your micro filter architecture. Right, but I, I think uh, stacking in this case uh, will not be beneficial because then, then one of the cathodes ends up to be not in, not in contact with the air. So, so that's why I think this is more uh, reasonable. Okay. Pretty much the questions I had. Um, let me see. I'm trying to make sure there's uh, anything else I'm missing. Yeah, I think I consumed all the questions I got. So, overall, um, when I uh, Look at uh, uh, Mr. Scully's uh, uh, thesis. Um, to me, it was a uh, pretty good exercise of uh, PhD level, or the, the doctoral level research on, on typical engineering uh, topic. Uh, so in this thesis and the presentation, Mr. Scully has developed a novel and, and very useful fabrication te microfabrication technologies for, for uh, fuel cell. And he has integrated some of the existing uh, micro-machining techni technologies like the nano uh, grass flex silicon method and make it useful for fuel cell develop, uh, fuel cell uh, um, architecture. But also he developed uh, some, some new way to make uh, micro-machine structures like uh, laser ablation and, and also introduced a new material as micro-machinable material in aluminum. While he was doing a uh, new uh, method of um, fabricating or patterning silicon with the uh, laser ablation and using bulk aluminum as a substrate for NEMS, he actually was contributing to general area of NEMS, not only just the fuel cell applications. Um, at this oral defense, as we all um, uh, 
witness, uh, he answered all of my questions very satisfactorily. Uh, and his explanation was clear and scientifically accurate. There are a couple of other things I did not fully agree, but we'll talk about it over the year. But those are very minor. Uh, so overall, uh, I think his uh, dissertation and his presentation, presentation was uh, quite satisfactory. So I'll be very glad to recommend him, Mr. Scotty, to the university uh, when the time comes. I don't know what your schedule is, but he, he con uh, conferred uh, the doctoral degree. So congratulations. observations to make on the dissertation here presented to kindly request the floor from the Kustos. May I please note that uh, these observations must be done here today, uh, otherwise you will lose your uh, right to make such an observation and you have two weeks time to put it in print and uh, deliver to the School of Chemical Technology. I know it's not customary. I've never had anybody make any observations. I've always told me to do it. So my observation is that I thank you for this very nice and entertaining, yet uh, technically very interesting uh, dissertation. <laughs> On behalf of Alton University School of Chemical Technology, I thank you, Professor Kim, for acting as an opponent today. And I thus declare this event uh, closed.